Hello everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining with us. Uh, it's our 263rd International Physics Webinar. And uh, today we we have with us here today Dr. Jenny Clark, Vice Chancellor Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Sheffield. And she has already connected with us. So uh, good afternoon, madam. And thanks for joining with us. So it's our honor and privilege to host you. So okay, well, dear student, yeah, I think you have already come to know the title of this. And the title is the uh, turning one photon into two or vice versa, the physics of singlet fission and triplet, triplet annihilation. So I think you will enjoy it. You can join with us uh, using this link. I will send this link in the comment section. Uh, so you can join and you can ask question, comment. About anything you will enjoy. It's your time you can start your session. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk um, in this series. Um, uh, I'm, as all of you, I've had a, a bit of a hard time with COVID recently and my uh, son has been very ill. So uh, get, forgive me if this talk is a bit... Um, unpracticed. But I want to talk to you about up and down conversion in um, organics, organic semiconductors. So this is a picture here of the physics department where I work at the University of Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield is a very hilly city and so therefore uh, we get a lot of rainbows because there's always rain in one valley and sun in another. So you can see this is the rainbow over the physics department. Now, I'm interested in um, solar energy conversion. Um, of course, we've got the uh, climate uh, emergency at the moment, and we need to be doing anything we can to increase solar energy efficiency. Unfortunately, for solar energy uh, harvesting, if I take the pen here, there's a pointer, solar energy harvesting, if you imagine here, this is the solar uh, flux, watts per square meter per, per nanometer, uh, plotted against uh, wavelength. In grey is everything in the solar spectrum that is absorbed by a silicon solar cell, like the silicon solar cells in the picture here. And in red is everything that's actually harvested by those solar, solar cells. And the maximum theoretical efficiency due to detailed balance is about 30%. So only 30% of the light that arrives at the solar cell um, actually is converted into um, usable electrical energy. And that's because, uh, quite obviously, in the infrared, the photons are simply not absorbed. They just pass, pass by because their energy is not high enough to be absorbed. Um, their energy is lower than the band gap of silicon. And in the uh, high energy photons, if you absorb, for example, a two electron volt photon, half of that energy, about one electron volt, is lost to heat. And then only one electron volt is going to be harvested. So you get a huge loss due to thermalization. And what we want to do is to try and see whether we, there's any way of uh, harvesting some of this extra energy which is lost. Um, and we could do that, for example, perhaps by taking some of these low energy photons, for example, red photons, these near infrared photons, and converting them into blue photons, into higher energy photons. And so if you take some of these red photons and then we could convert them into blue photons and have them be harvested by the solar cell. And we call this up conversion. So you take two low energy photons and combine them to make one high energy photon. Or, and this is a, a doctored image because you can't actually do this in solutions like this, you could take one high energy photon and then create two low energy photons. And if we did that, then we would overcome some of the thermalization because if you immediately split your two electron, two electron volt photon into two one electron volt photons and inject both of those into the solar cell, then you've uh, overcome thermalization as long as that happens very rapidly. And if you could do this, then you could improve your solar cell efficiency. In black here is the maximum solar cell efficiency as a function of the band gap of the solar cell material in a single junction device. Um, and you can see it's about 30%. And if you used uh, up conversion, which is this one, so converting two low energy photons into one high energy photon, then you could go above 40%. So you get a dramatic increase. And this would be particularly good for the low energy, high energy band gap uh, materials such as perovskites, the high energy, um, high efficiency perovskite solar cells. Likewise, if you could do the down conversion, then you could go up to kind of 45%. And this would be particularly good for silicon solar cells. So if you put a layer on top of your silicon solar cell that could do the down conversion, you could dramatically improve your solar cell efficiency. And this is 
possible. So people have shown in 2020, this paper came out in Nature Photonics from Tim Schmidt's group, showing that you can get photochemical upconversion of near infrared light from below the silicon band gap. So they were able to upconvert infrared light um, and then detect, uh, catch it by a silicon um, device. You can also do it the other way around. So this is was shown um, by Baldo's group that you can get sensitization of silicon by single exciton fission in tetracene. And so that's this up this down conversion process over here. And what they called that was single exciton fission. And that's a simple down conversion process. It's a down conversion process that happens in organic semiconductors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about single exciton fission. So in single exciton fission, what you need is two chromophores or two organic molecules. If you take two molecules and you excite them in such a way that you have excitation over both of those molecules or both of those chromophores, and you create a singlet excited state. So initially this excited state, so you put in a photon, the initial excited state has got spin zero. So it's a spin zero excited state with a spin up electron and a spin down electron in the simplest picture of the excited state. And that singlet excited state then can fission or can break apart into two lower energy um, excited states. So obviously, in order to conserve energy, this high energy uh, singlet state has to be at least twice this two lower energy excited states. And it splits into a pair of triplet excitons. So it starts out as a singlet state, as a singlet exciton, and then it splits up into two triplet excitons or two um, triplet excited states. And both of these triplets have spin one. So now you have, for example, spin up, spin up, or spin down, spin down. And overall, because you, um, you can do that, overall, they have to have spin zero. So you have to conserve the, the spin quantum number. So first of all, you start with a singlet state, and then it splits into two triplet states that overall form a singlet state. And this is the process of singlet fission. You can also do it backwards, and we might call that triplet fusion, but more often it's called triplet, triplet annihilation to form the singlet state. And that's the process of upconversion that we talked about. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, singlets and triplets and the energies of singlets and triplets, particularly in organic semiconductors. And organic semiconductors are simply carbon-based um, molecular semiconductors, where the building block of your uh, device is not an atom, but is a, a molecule. And you can build that up in these systems. Um, there's a generally quite a large exchange energy, and this exchange energy gives you a splitting between the singlet and triplet excitations in your semiconductor. So you have these ex excitons, a single exciton and a triple exciton, and you have a large exchange energy between them. And the exchange energy is typically between 0.5 and 1 electron volt. Um, there's also, and we'll come on to these um, a bit later, there's also these triplet states here. There are three triplet states. They're more or less degenerate. There is splitting between them due to dipolar coupling um, and the zero field splitting, but this is on the order of 10 micro electron volts. So it's very, very small due to these DNA parameters. So we can kind of, for the most part, uh, forget about those. Now, singlet fission occurs in specific molecules where two times the, where the exchange energy is so large that the triplet is half the energy of the singlet, less than half, uh, half the energy of the singlet or less. And that means that energetically, you can split your singlet exciton into two triplet exitons, and that's allowed energetically. The problem with the down conversion and the up conversion for solar cells is that triplets are dark. And triplets are dark because the ground state in almost all organic semiconductor systems is a singlet, whereas the first ex this triplet excited state is got obviously um, a triplet, so it has spin one. And so you can't directly emit from the triplets and you can't directly absorb into the triplets manifold. And so you have to overcome that in some way. And so what I'm going to talk about today is what happens if we strong couple to that singlet state. So what happens if we mix that singlet state and put it in a microcavity and create a splitting of that singlet state? Okay, what I'm going to focus on to start with is triplet-triplet annihilation. So we're going to start with two free triplets. And then we're going to see what happens if we combine them into a singlet. And then we're going to put our system into a microcavity, and that's going to cause a splitting of the energy levels. And we're going to end up with um, a polariton state. And we're going to see what happens to our triplet triplet annihilation when we look at that. So I'm going to start by talking about polaritons. Um, 
This has been done before. So in the, this paper here at Advanced Functional Materials, uh, this group put tetracine, this molecule here, into a microcavity in a, such a way that the, um, the exciton and the photon that was in the cavity mixed together to create what's called a polariton. And when they did that, they found that the delay, there was an increase in the amount of delayed fluorescence. So this is fluorescence here against time. And outside the array, they had this red curve. And this delayed fluorescence here is because you've got the triplets which are recombining to create something that is emissive. So this is an indication that you're getting triplet-triplet annihilation. And when they strong coupled to it, they were able to see an increase in the delayed fluorescence. So we thought, well, let's try that same experiment, but now do it with proper triplet-triplet annihilation up conversion. So in triplet-triplet annihilation up conversion, you put in some green lights, some lower energy light, and then into your solution, you get the uh, blue light out. So you're putting in low energy photons and you're getting out um, up converted photons. And this is relatively straightforward and easy to do in solution. And it's very efficient in solution, but we need to do it in the solid in order to look at what happens if you put this system in a, in a micro cavity. So this is the system that was just in the solution there. And you can see that you've got these platinum based molecules which um, absorb in the red. So these platinum-based molecules, um, they can absorb light to directly form a triplet state. So we absorb, absorb light in the triplet state, and we create lots of triplets on these platinum molecules. So we absorb the green light. And then these triplets transfer onto the diphenylanthracene, these other molecules which have higher energy um, states and they combine those two triplets combine to form one singlet which can then emit the blue light and that's what's happening in this solution Oops. solution where you get the green light which is being absorbed by the platinum containing molecules and then you're getting the blue light out from the diphenyl anthracenes and so the triplets are being generated and then they transfer onto the diphenyl anthracenes and then you're getting the light out and so we put these platinum molecules and these diphenylanthracene molecules into a thin film. Um, and we get this, uh, the absorption spectrum here. There's a little bit of absorption in the green, which is from the platinum. And then there's a large absorption in the blue, which is from the diphenylanthracene. But all of the emission comes from the, uh, almost all of, a lot of the emission comes from the diphenylanthracene when we excite at 532, even in the film, although And then we put this blend, this diphenylanthracene and platinum porphyrin, into a, a micro cavity. So we put it um, between two mirrors. So we've got a silver mirror at the bottom, and then our semiconducting film in the middle with our platinum porphyrin and our diphenylanthracene. And then we have a semi transparent silver uh, top mirror. And because of that um, mirror, construction, then you get a photon a cavity, electric field profile being trapped inside the cavity. And because you've got a cav photon being trapped inside there, it then the photon interacts that's trapped in there interacts with the excitons within the film, and you create new states called polaritons. And we know that you get these new states called polaritons because if you look at the reflectivity, this here is a plot of reflectivity against angle and against wavelength. If you just had a bare cavity um, with no organic semiconductor in there, you'd get a reflectivity that looks like this yellow line here, because as you tilt the cavity, you get different wavelengths being reflected and different wavelengths being trapped within the cavity. So you get a dispersion of the cavity mode. And if you just had the organic semiconductors in there with no cavity, then you would have an absorption spectrum that looks like this. So your reflectivity would have um, uh, minima at these dotted lines here, dashed lines here. But when you mix the two and you go into what's called the strong coupling regime, then you mix the cavity and the exciton and you end up with these new uh, transitions. So here you have a lower polariton branch, which the lower polariton branch is half cavity, half uh, exciton. And it has a dispersion which um, and a avoided crossing to the uh, exciton band. So you have this dispersion here then you have a middle polariton branch and an upper polariton branch. And this shows us that this um, diphenylanthracene is strong coupled to the photon mode within the cavity. 
And when we looked at the delayed emission of this system, which does triplet-triplet annihilation, we find that compared to the film, we get an increase in the delayed emission, just like the previous people saw when they just looked at triplet-triplet annihilation. And this was quite surprising. We know that it's to do with triplets because we can look at this material here, which has no triplets, no, no long-lived triplets at all in it. And when we strong couple to this, and we can see that we have some, some strong coupling, it's a little bit weaker. We've got the lower polariton branch, the middle polariton branch, and the upper polariton branch here. Then we see no difference between the cavity and the film. The lifetimes are identical. And so when we have no triplets, we have no enhancement in the lifetime. We also know that if we have weak intersystem crossing and then look for um, triplet triplet annihilation, when we have triplets, um, we have an enhancement. Then we can quench the triplets by adding oxygen to our system. And when we quench the triplets, we have no enhancement anymore. So we definitely know that this triplets are due to, um, uh, that this enhancement in the lifetime is definitely due to these triplets and this triplet triplet annihilation. But we want to look at this in a bit more detail. So we want to look at what happens if in a system where we know that we're going to generate loads and loads of triplets. And we do that by looking at a system that does singlet fission. So we excite the singlets. We make loads of triplets because the singlets split in two to form triplets. And then we look at what happens and we look at the delayed emission from those triplets as they do triplet triplet annihilation. And we want to see what happens when we put it in the strong couple regime. And the molecule we're going to look at for that is this one. It's uh, tetracine on the backbone, and then it's got these side groups. It's called TIPS tetracine. It's made by John Anthony in the University of Kentucky. Uh, and it's been very well studied. And so it's a good model system to use to understand what's going on in this case. So again, we put it in a micro cavity. So we put it between two mirrors, and we make a thin film between two mirrors. And then we look at the dispersion. This is, again, angle and wavelength and then reflectivity on the z-axis. Again, this is the cavity mode that we would expect for a bare cavity. We've got the excitons in blue. And then you can again see the avoided crossings and the polariton branches, the lower polariton, the middle polariton, and the upper polariton. The emission all comes from the bottom of the lower polariton branch. And then we can look at the time resolved emission. And again, um, in this case, when we got the in the regime of the delayed emission, you get um, an increase in the delayed, in the long lived. Uh, emission in the delayed emission when we go to the micro cavity. And it was such a large effect here that we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing something wrong. So we made films in lots of different ways. We had spacer layers between the organic layer and the mirror. We had evaporated the molecules or we spun coated the molecules. And in each case, it was only when we had the micro cavity that we saw an effect. So we only saw an effect where we had the strong coupled micro cavity. So what we can say so far is that if you strong couple and you're doing triplet-triplet annihilation, and then you get an increased intensity in the delayed emission, but we still don't really understand why. So we're going to look a little bit more at the physics of these pairs of triplets, um, I, which are generated either through singlet fission or by triplet-triplet annihilation. So... When I first started looking at singlet fission, I just imagined that there was a singlet that then split into free triplets. But of course, when you start to look at things in more detail, it turns out that in the middle, everything is a lot more complicated. So you start with a singlet, and then you generate something that's initially a triplet pair state, and then it turns into a different type of triplet pair state, and then eventually you get free triplets. And there's been a lot of work on this in recent years, and here are four reviews that came out not too long ago on triplet pair states in organic semiconductors, uh, and um, including one that I wrote with my colleague, Andrew Musser. So let's go back to basics. If you've got two, uh, if you've got triplet pairs, then you have two triplets. In two triplets, you've got four electrons. Um, and so there are several different ways of putting together the spins of those four electrons. You could put them up all pointing up, then you'd have a spin quantum number of two, and that would give you a quintet. And in fact, there are five quintets, so five ways of getting spin S equals two. Um, you could have S equals one, that would give you a triplet state, or S equals zero, and that gives you a singlet state. If there are four electrons, there are 16 ways of putting together four electrons. Um, and you can write down the spin wave functions of those. This is just the MS equals zero spin parts of the wave functions. Um, but you end up with two singlets, nine triplets, and five quintets. 
And these are the lower energy ones. So this, this singlet, this triplet, and this quintet are the lowest energy ones. And this is taken from a paper from the 1990s by Colmar. And these nine states that you end up with here, one singlet, five quintets, and three triplets, those are the nine states that Merrifield talked about in the 1960s and 70s, if you're interested. These are the key papers to look at from the background theory. Okay, to first order, we can ignore the triplet triplet pair. So we can ignore these triplets here because they have a different symmetry compared to the singlet and quintet. And so to first order, the singlet and quintet are degenerate. They have exactly the same energy and it's the same energy as two times an individual triplet. So if you take two triplets and you put them together, you're going to get something uh, that has a singlet or triplet or quintet. But there are actually interactions. There are interactions between the electrons there are in exchange interactions between the electrons. There's dipolar interactions between the different triplets. Um, and so we have to think about that when we're thinking about the relative energies of all of these states. So let's first assume that we have J equals zero, so no exchange coupling. So now we have degenerate singlet and, trip uh, singlet and quintet states. And of course, if you've got degenerate states and there's a bit of coupling, then you're going to get some mixing between the states. And when you get mixing between the states, that means that spin is no longer a good quantum number. And so the eigenstates in this case, when j equals zero and there's no exchange coupling between the triplets, means that you've got um, mixed spin states. And we call them one or five TT. And um, just to say that the exchange coupling depends on orbital overlap. So if you have no orbital overlap, then you've got no exchange coupling. Um, and that's the case that we see. Now, in this case, if you do singlet fission, you have to create a pure spin state. And because you create a pure spin state, but the eigenstates cannot have, but, but spin is not a good quantum number, that means that you can see quantum beating. And in fact, this has been observed uh, first in the 1980s, but again, and more convincingly um, by uh, John Burdett and Chris Bardeen, where they say very, they saw very clear quantum beating in the delayed fluorescence because of this mixed spin state picture. On the other hand, if your triplets have wave function overlap, then the exchange coupling isn't zero. And now there's a, uh, you break the degeneracy between the quintet and the singlet states. And so now the triplet pair states are pure spin states. And in this case, uh, you're not going to see any quantum beating because there's no mixing anymore. And singlet fission is going to generate a pure spin state. Okay, so there are these two limiting cases. The first case, you've got mixed spin states where you see quantum beating. And then the other case, you've got these pure spin states where you're getting um, uh, uh, exchange coupling is important. And that's because you've got this orbital overlap between the triplets. And in that case, you can see direct 1TT emission because it's a singlet state, it can still emit. And so you can get emissions from this uh, biexitonic state. Okay, so we talked about polaritons to start with. Now we've talked a little bit about pairs of triplets. So you've got mixed spin states, if your triplet so far away from each other, far enough away from each other that they have no orbital overlap, or pure spin states um, if they're close together. And it depends on this exchange coupling term. So what kind of triplet pair states do we have in our, in our semiconductors? And how are we going to explain the delayed emission that we saw when we made uh, microcavities? So first of all, let's see, can we see any evidence of um, 1TT emission in our systems. And if we see evidence of 1TT emission, that means that our triplet pairs are strongly exchange coupled. So let's look at pentacene. Uh, pentacene is a good one to study emission in because uh, the exchange energy is very large. And so the singlet is well above the two times the triplet. So if we're getting triplet pair emission, we're not going to see any singlet emission because singlet fission is the dominant non-radiative decay. So we excite into S1. And then singlet fission happens with an 80 femtosecond time constant, and we generate our pairs of triplets. And if we're generating coupled triplets, so these emissive tri pure spin state triplet pair states, then we should see emission from them, and we, we shouldn't be seeing any S1 emission, or not very much S1 emission. And so to be sure of what we're looking at, we wanted to look in very clean crystals, so we... Um, my student David, who's recently recently passed his uh, examination, um, went to University of Heidelberg with Mike Matheson and Yana Zamzai, and they did some work on these pentacene single crystals. 
And in these pentacene single crystals, they um, grew them using a two-stage sublimation process of triple sublime starting material. It took a very long time, but they made these really nice crystals. And this is just the optical, the absorption spectra of the crystal, and you can see the nice Davidov splitting. So we know that what we've got is really nice pentacene. And just as a bit of background, um, a few years ago, we measured single crystals, not quite as nice, um, on transient absorption spectroscopy as a function of excitation density. This is the um, triplet lifetime as a function of fluence, as a function of excitation density on short time, so on the picosecond times, and then on the nanosecond times. And what you can see from this is that as you increase the excitation density, that your triplets start to decay faster. And what we were able to do with this model, was, with, with this data, was to remodel it. Since 2014, a lot of ha has happened in the singlet vision literature, and we were able to remodel this data using a rate model, using rates that have been taken from the literature. So we're able to model the data using model rates, and so without varying any parameters apart from um, a scaling parameter so that we could get the excitation density correct. So apart from that scaling parameter to get the excitation density correct because it wasn't reported in the original paper, we're able to model the data simply based on literature values. And these are the lines that we see here. What's happening here is as you generate two triplets in pentacene that they start to annihilate together. And so at the, the higher excitation density, the faster the triplet lifetime because the triplets are all bumping into each other and annihilating each other. So what we want to do is we want to look in this region here where we can see that as you increase the excitation density, you're getting a faster and faster triplet lifetime. And we want to see in this region where we're getting bimolecular triplet-triplet annihilation, so we're generating triplets, triplet pairs that then annihilate, do we see any emission? So can we observe triplet pair emission on this timescale to show us whether we're getting these strongly exchange coupled bi-exciton states or not? And if we do observe emission, does it follow our predicted TT emission from the transient absorption kinetic modeling that came from the literature? Okay, so this is what we did. We took those tiny crystals that were generated and we put them in a cryostat and measured their time resolved emission. This is wavelength on this axis against time on this axis. And you can see that here we've got a short uh, lived emission and here we've got a longer lived emission because the intensity goes out for longer. And this longer lived emission, this 750 nanometers, is where we expect our two times the triplet energy to be. So we expect the triplet pair emission to be in this region here. And this is where we expect our singlet emission to be. And then we can compare. This is now uh, photoluminescence intensity against time. And you can just see the decays here. So the first thing we see is that this is the 1TT prediction from the transient absorption and the 1TT emission matches very well with what we observe after the instrument response function, which is about four nanoseconds in this case. And then we can do an intensity dependence and we can compare the intensity dependence that we measure from our emission with the intensity dependence that we predict we should see for our triplet pair emission. And we find that they match extremely well, which was uh, surprisingly well, in fact. So this is over different times, two to four nanoseconds, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 50 nanoseconds. And you can see the markers here are what we measure. So this is the photoluminescence intensity as a function of pulse energy, as a fun function of excitation density at 77 Kelvin. And you can see that the dashed line, which is the the model, the prediction, matches very well with what we observe. So we can say that in pentacene, we're definitely observing this uh, um, emission from this tightly bound for this bi-exiton uh, triplet pair state. So we know that in pentacene, this state definitely exists. So we've got these strongly bound triplet pairs. We also wanted to see what happened in another mo molecule, which is DIFTSADT, where S1 is roughly equal to 2 times T1. Um, we'd measured this before, and before we'd measured uh, the fluorescence lifetime out to here, out to a few nanoseconds, and we'd measured the transient absorption of the triplets out for much longer. So this is the triplet population. So we know that the triplet population lives for a really long time, but that the emission decays quite dramatically. And the reason the emission decays quite dramatically is because, first of all, you generate a singlet triplet pair, which can emit, and then over time, it turns into other types of triplet pairs, and it loses its coherence. 
But now we're going to do the same experiment again. We're going to look at long times and we're going to crank up the excitation density and we're going to see, okay, do we see triplet-triplet annihilation and the generation of this triplet pair emission? And this time we're going to cool it down to 100 Kelvin just to make sure that we suppress um, any back transfer to the singlet. And first we find that our data at... Um, Room temperature at low fluence matches what we measured before, which is really good. And this again, this is wavelength against time. And on the z-axis is the fluorescence intensity. And what we're going to look at is this region out here where there's very little intensity at low fluence. And then we're going to crank up the intensity. And as we crank up the intensity of the laser, of the fluence, we're seeing more and more emission in this region. And that's the triplet pair emission, which is generated by bimolecular annihilation. And you can see here at... 10 microseconds, we get the same emission as at 20 to 30 nanoseconds, which we'd previously att attributed to this bi-exiton emission. And that's very different compared to the singlet emission. And importantly, we don't get any of this singlet emission. And just uh, to check that we really understand what's going on, this was the original Merrifield model of singlet fission, where you go from singlets to a range of triplet pairs to free triplets. We have to modify that slightly to include our tightly bound triplet pair state and then our weakly bound triplet pair states. And using this model, we're then able to model our emission dynamics very, very well um, across all temperature ranges and all fluences that we measured. And then as a check, we also were able to measure the to, to model the um, magnetic field dependence of the um, emission. And the magnetic field dependence occurs because you've got these weakly bound triplet pair states, um, which um, the spin uh, combination depends on the magnetic field because um, the, the exchange coupling is so weak that only small magnetic fields allow you to change the, the, the type of um, spin state that you end up with in that system, which then changes the rates of singlet fission and triplet triplet annihilation. Okay. So we find that bimolecular triplet-triplet annihilation populates this emissive um, bound triplet pair state, this pure spin state. So then the question was, okay, do we see any evidence of these other types of states, these weakly bound triplet pair states? And remember, the evidence for them was that we should see quantum beating. And it turns out that we do. For this diff -test ADT molecule here, when we make a film of that, we see this quantum beating with the three characteristic uh, frequencies that we would expect so do both exist in the same material at the same time? It really seems so. So the lifetime here is the lifetime of this triplet pair state, the prompt triplet pair state that's generated from, from singlet fission. And so it looks like we're getting these weakly bound triplet pair states and the strongly bound triplet pair states all at the same time. How can that be? Well, it must be that there's a time-dependent exchange energy. So we're getting some kind of triplet hopping or intermolecular vibrations, um, which causes a change in the orbital overlap. And that happens over time. And so therefore you have both the strongly bound and the weakly bound triplet pair states, which alters the spin physics of the triplet pair states. So there's lots of different triplet pair states when you're going from singlet to free triplets or from free triplets to singlet. Um, and you get both at the same time. These states exist in the same material at the same time due to these fluctuating exchange uh, interactions, possibly triplet hopping. Um, and the equilibrium favors these dark, weakly bound triplet pair states, probably. Okay, so let's go back to our polaritons. Can we now explain our increase in the delayed emission? So remember we saw when we put our TIPS tetracine between two mirrors and then did strong coupling to it to create polaritons, then we found this increase in the delayed emission. So that means this triplet pair state, we got more emission out. And we did some uh, rate modeling on there and to cut a very long story short, and we also worked with uh, Huawei Zhu's group on this, to cut a long story short, because all of the times constants are very small, are very slow, so that all of these time constants turn out to be very slow. A small change in the times constant allows us to harvest some of these weakly bound triplet pair states, so sidestepping this, uh, this process. So when you put your system in a microcavity, you can directly harvest some of these weakly bound triplet pair states. And now what we're looking at is to see if we can uh, use what we've discovered about this and about the fact that when you put your system into a polariton, into a microcavity, 
can we use this to make more efficient ways of harvesting um, the low energy photons to create uh, better solar cells? So, for example, could we put a micro cavity under a solar cell and harvest some of these, these extra photons? And so that's some of the research that we're looking at now. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people who worked on this, uh, particularly Andrew Musser, who's now in Cornell, uh, David Bosagni, who now works for a solar cell company, uh, Daniel Polak, uh, Rahul, uh, thanks to the people in Heidelberg who helped with the single crystals. The polariton theory was done by uh, Luis martinez Martinez and Juan Wanju. Materials came from um, Ian Andrews and Martin Heaney at Imperial, John Anthony, Keelan Fallon and Hugo Bronstein. And I'd like to thank Sheff uh, David Lidsey in Sheffield for collaboration and the Lord Porter Laser Facility and EPSRC for funding. And thank you very much for your attention. Like uh, thank you, Madam, uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation. So we haven't got any question yet. So as the video will stay in mind in YouTube and Facebook. So if uh, I'll get uh, any question, then I can inform you. Okay, so, that's great. Madam, uh, if any of our students and viewers want to join your group, so what uh, he or she need to do? Uh, yes, if you want to join my group, uh, you should send me an email. If you, um, the best is if you can find a fellowship or a <laughs> something. But at the moment, I have, I will be soon having one postdoc position open. So if anybody who has experience of okay. strong coupling um, is interested in joining us, we'd be very happy to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye for today. Goodbye. Have a nice day.